And I thought, wow, that's, that's the definition of it right there. When, when the Bible speaks, God speaks. So can you say that with me? When the Bible speaks, God speaks. Now, let me read the word to you. Mark chapter 1, starting at verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon-possessed, and the whole town gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. As we continue our study in the book of Mark, the gospel according to Mark, we're trying to get an idea of how Mark is writing this book through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, why he's writing, why he's recording, what he's recording. And one of the things we looked at is that Mark is writing to a Gentile audience that does not have the in-depth knowledge of the Old Testament of the Jews. The Jews, if you were Jewish, you would know the Old Testament. You would know all the stories of the Old Testament. It was taught to you from a very young age. But the audience that Mark is writing to is a Gentile audience that wouldn't have had, they may have known about the Old Testament, but they wouldn't have had that in-depth knowledge about it. And so what I see happening is here is that Mark is going the public route, the public route. He's He's bringing up things about Jesus that happened in the public that they could see and they could hear and they could hold on to and grab a hold of, even if they didn't have the knowledge of the Old Testament. So as of a review here, next slide is Mark goes public with his name. I mean, he says this coming king, his name is Jesus. He's not only Jesus, he's the Christ, he's the Messiah. Not only that, his genealogy is he is the son of God. So he goes public with his name. This is who I'm talking about. The second thing, Mark goes public with his messenger, with his messenger. There would always be a messenger that would go ahead of the coming king and clear the way for the king that was coming. Well, Mark announces his name is John, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist came and and preached repentance and preached confession and forgiveness of sins. That was the way that we prepared the way for the Lord to come in our lives. The third thing is Mark goes public with his baptism. With his baptism. When Jesus got baptized, it was different than all the other baptisms. Heavens parted, Holy Spirit descended like a dove, and God spoke. And it was a public event that happened that they would have been able to be either in on or hear of people who had been there. Fourth thing is Jesus goes public with his followers. Now Jesus is calling out to men saying, come follow me, come right behind me and follow after me. And he names them Peter and Andrew and James and John. So they're publicly been spoken of. These are the first ones that were called to follow Jesus. And then Mark goes public with his authority, with Jesus' authority. And last week we found Jesus in the synagogue in a gathering of people who believed God and and he spoke like none other. He, he didn't speak like the, rab, like the rabbis or like the scribes who would say, well, Rabbi so-and-so says this, Rabbi so-and-so says this. No, Jesus didn't speak that way. Jesus said, but I say to you. And he stood with such authority. And then the last one, number six, is Mark goes public with his power. 
And we saw that last week when, when they're in this synagogue, in this public meeting, evil speaks out, a demon speaks out. And what does Jesus do publicly? He addressed the sin. He muzzled the sin. He, he gave the correct biblical solution to it. He said, you need to get out of here. And then Jesus stood there. He stood there showing that the power of light was greater than the power of darkness. And so what Mark is doing here, what I see what he's doing here, is he's bringing out all these public things that Jesus was a part of so his Gentile readers who wouldn't have the in-depth knowledge of the Old Testament would have something to go on about this King Jesus that he was introducing to them. So this morning, we're going to look at three more things that Mark brings out into the public. So if we go back to verse 29 through 31, it says, and immediately, that's Mark's favorite word, right away, right after that church service, after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew and James and John. And now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever. And immediately, I mean, right away, they came up to him and spoke to Jesus about her. And he came to her and raised her up. And taking her by the hand, the fever left her and she waited on them. So some things to note here. First thing off was Peter was married. Peter was married. It's awful hard to have a mother-in-law without being married. Chuckle, chuckle, chuckle. Yeah. I've tried to figure out how to do that, but it doesn't work. Now, he was married. He was, I love my mother-in-law. She might listen to this. Um, 1 Corinthians 9.5 is also another passage that you can go to that, that shows and speaks of the, many of the apostles were married, and specifically, Peter was married. So, Peter was married. Second thing, high possibility that his mother-in-law is, at this time, a widow. She's possibly a widow. There's no mention of her husband. She's in her son-in-law's home. Lots of times that's what would happen is if one passed away, then you would take that widow into your home and care for them. So uh, high possibility she's a widow. Third thing is that when Luke tells about this account, he says the fever is high. He says megas. He says it's a high fever. And Luke is a doctor. And so if a doctor is stating, say, stating that this is a high fever, most likely then this could possibly be a life-threatening illness. It could be life-threatening illness that she could be on her deathbed. That might be why the disciples, as soon as Jesus gets to the house, they immediately, like it's of urgency that we tell you about Peter's mother-in-law. The next thing to note here is that Jesus came to her and touched her. Now, this is the first time that Mark records anything like this. He's recording this Jesus who's out in the public. It's very big crowds in the synagogue, everything out in the open. I mean, he's facing down Satan, casting out demons. Um, I mean, this, but now he's in a house, and he's got at least four disciples with him. And there's someone who's Peter's mother-in-law, but we're not even given her name. And she may be on her deathbed. She's in bad shape. And what does our King Jesus do? He stops. He goes into the room. He comes up to right where she's at. And he touches her. And the next thing to note there is how much is she healed? How much is she healed? Well, she's so healed. She heads right for the kitchen. I mean, that's how much she's healed. I mean, she's laying on the bed, high fever, one second. The next sec seg second, she's in the kitchen whipping up pancakes. I don't know if it was pancakes. But it's, it's, that's something to know about the healing touch of God, is that it's instantaneously there. You know, she could have said, well, it sounds like a Chick-fil-A day. You guys head down there for it. No, she didn't do that. She went right in to serve her master. Now, here's point number one. The first thing I want to pull out of here is that Jesus is a king who's familiar with his subjects. I'm just kind of keeping that king theme going and calling us subjects, but he's familiar with his subjects. He knows them. Even though their names are not given, he knows exactly what they're going through. And he is a king who will set all else aside 
and stop for one. And maybe that's what you need to hear this morning. That this busy Jesus that Mark will over and all, he'll say immediately, immediately, mean Jesus is going from one place to the next, just a nonstop, that this Jesus will stop for one, even an unnamed one. Most of the ones he stopped for were unnamed. We don't even have their names. He'll go all the way across the Sea of Galilee for one person. He will stop the whole entourage that's following around him just for one person. And maybe that's what you need to hear this morning. That you might feel like, you know, I'm, I'm really nobody. And you really are. All of us are nobodies. But you might feel like God doesn't even know I'm here. Uh, he does. Might feel like he's too busy. He's running the universe and all that kind of stuff. But he will stop. And he will come into you, come into your room. And he will touch you. You know, touch you in such a way that you'll turn around 180 degrees and be in a whole different situation. So there's that little picture of King Jesus. Now he goes a little farther. You have to realize 32 through 34 here. See, now, now we've got a Jesus who cast out a demon in the synagogue. That would have brought that big news about that. And now possibly this woman on her deathbed, it gets out that he... He touched her and healed her. So 32 through 34, when evening came after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door. And he, he healed many who were ill with various diseases, cast out demons. And he, he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. A few more things here. Mark gives us the detail that they waited until sundown to bring people to Jesus. And he does this because he's writing to a Gentile audience. And, and they would have not understood the whole practice that in the Jewish audience, you had the Sabbath. And the Sabbath started on Friday night at sundown and went till Sunday at sun, or Saturday at sundown. And so during that time period, from Friday night to Saturday sundown, Friday sundown, Saturday sundown, there were certain things that you did and didn't do. And one of the things that you did not do during that time was carry any type of burden. And so Mark just lets us, why did they bring all these people who were ill or demon-possessed? Most of them they had to carry. And so they had to wait until the sun went down. And that restriction was lifted so that they could bring all these people to Jesus. Mark just throws that little thing in there. The city of Capernaum at that time, the population was about 1,500 so that kind of gives you a, kind of an idea when he says the whole city is at the door. That's, that's quite a few people, 1,500 people. All this without internet, email, instant messenger, Facebook, Twitter, or the church phone prayer chain. We, we, we love technology. But really, if, if all the technology failed, we would still be able to get things around. Don't worry about it. Yeah, don't worry about it. That, that, it travels fast. The next thing to note here is that Jesus continues to give no platform for the demons to speak. And he makes uh, that point is just brought out. That when Jesus came across evil, when ke Jesus came across darkness, he stopped it in its tracks. And he did not allow it to speak. And I looked at that and I thought, well, you know, the reason he didn't, I think the reason he didn't allow it to speak is because we shouldn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ by the word of the demons. We should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because of Jesus and that Jesus died on the cross and that Jesus rose again and that Jesus is coming again. He was the one to give that message, not, not the demons. So the last point here is that Jesus' healings were very public. And so Mark is bringing this out to his readers. Are there 1,500 in the town, and most likely you're going to find somebody who was healed by Jesus. I mean, he's emptying out the hospitals in the northern part of Israel at this point. 
because people are dragging them to, to Jesus, and Jesus is touching them. It's very public. Most likely, you're going to come across somebody who says, I was touched, I was healed by Jesus. He goes on a little bit farther, 35 through 37. It says, in the early morning. Now, so all these, it's, sun, it's Saturday night. All these people are coming to the house. Finally, they, finally, he's touched everybody. He's only most like early morning before the sun is up. So it's early. I mean, and it, it was daylight savings time weekend, too, when this happened. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went away to a secluded place, and was praying there. Simon and his, com- his companions searched for him, and they found him and said to him, everyone's looking for you. First point to note here is Jesus is a morning person. I think if you read the scripture and you go through the scripture, lots of times you see this pattern that he has of getting up early in the morning and meeting with the Lord. The second thing here is just the pattern of the Lord. Jesus got baptized. Why do we get baptized? Well, we get baptized to to be a public statement of our repentance of sins and and following after him. But also, you know, Jesus set that precedent, and Jesus did that, so we get baptized. Last week, we looked at Jesus went to church. And we go to church to worship the Lord and everything, but to realize that our Savior and Lord that we are following, he went to church. So we go there. We go there. The third thing here is that Jesus got alone to pray. Jesus got alone to pray. So when we talk about a quiet time, when we talk about a time to get alone with God on a, on a regular basis, to open up the word of God and to talk to him, one of the reasons we might do that is because Jesus did that. If we are followers of him, we are going to do the same things that he was doing. Um, Peter assumes uh, a leadership role here. This is the first time that we see this. It says Peter and his companions. So Peter is, is, is elevated up a little bit as the leader of the group at this point. And they bring something that seems urgent to Jesus. And I want you to just kind of get the picture in your head. Those people were all healed the night before. Jesus gets a little bit of sleep, sneaks out of the house, finds a secluded place to pray. And early in the morning... I mean, that phone chain has been working overtime through the night, and there's a knock at the door. And, and, and Peter wakes up and goes to the door, and, and, and there's a group of people out there that need to be healed and touched. And, and we heard that Jesus was here, and Peter's going, well, where is he? Uh-oh. We'll find him. Hold on. Just wait a minute. We'll find him. And so they're frantically on this search for Jesus because there seems to be an urgent need back at the house that needs attention. The second thing about King Jesus here is that King Jesus is concerned with his fellowship with God. King Jesus is concerned with his fellowship with God. And uh, the next thing I put down there is, how big is your Jesus? It's a question to ask yourself. How big is your Jesus? Is your Jesus... Big enough that you would get up early to meet with him? I mean, is your Jesus big enough that you would get alone with him on a regular basis? Just that it's just you and him? Is he big enough for that? I mean, if someone was looking for you, they're trying to find you, wouldn't it be so cool if they found you praying if that's the posture that they found you in, was that you were, they found you in your time alone with God. So this morning, maybe, maybe you needed to hear that, you know, Jesus will stop for you. No matter who you are, he, he will stop for you. He will care for you. He knows you. He's familiar with you. But maybe the other one is that, that maybe you need to hear this morning that you need to stop for God. That busy Jesus stopped everything and would address a single individual. But here I am. I'm too busy for God. And I need to be just face to face that, wait a minute, my Jesus, my Savior, he, he got up early even. If, it, if that's what it needed, it, t- it took, he got up early to get alone with his Heavenly Father. 
And I know the busyness of life. And I know what it's like having four kids and, and everything. But we, we have to realize that everything around our lives centers around that relationship that we have with him. And when we take the element of that relationship out or that constant care toward that relationship, it is going to affect you. So maybe that's what you need to hear this morning is that maybe, maybe I'm too busy for God <laughs> and I need to stop and I need to get myself in front of God on a regular basis. One more thing, 38 and 39 rounds it out because Jesus is going to respond to this urgent need. He said to them, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also. For this is what I came for. And he went into the synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. First point here is what seemed urgent was not what was essential. What seemed urgent was not what was essential. Because if we play out this scene, Peter says to these people that are outside the house, wait a minute, we'll go find them. Finds Jesus praying. Says to P Peter says to Jesus, man, there's everybody's looking for you. Seems urgent. But what does Jesus do? He says, no, let's go this direction. And I want you to see that. He, he came to preach and therefore left many healings behind. He didn't go back to that house to heal those people. No, he said, what's most essential in my life is to go to these other towns and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to drive out demons. That's the most important thing. That's what's essential that needs to happen. And another point there is this, it's common to find Jesus in church and addressing sin. It's interesting that he points this out. He goes from synagogue to synagogue to synagogue to synagogue, and, he's a, and there's casting out demons. So it was a common problem that was happening there. But he continued to address sin. When it came up, he did not skirt it. He did not sweep it under the rug. It was like, no, this needs to be taken care of. So number three, here's the third thing about King Jesus, is he is very focused. He's very focused. What is essential to Jesus is preaching the word and dealing with the devil. And, and maybe that's what you needed to hear this morning. Maybe, maybe that's what you needed to hear about Jesus, that the main thing about Jesus is, is the salvation of souls. So a little application at the end here. Mark is telling us what King Jesus is like. First off, King Jesus will stop for the unknown. King Jesus will stop for the, the unknown. Jesus will stop for you. The second one is that King Jesus makes time to be alone with God. King Jesus takes time to be alone with God. Uh, and that we need to stop for Jesus. And you might find yourself in that category where you've been going, going so fast that it's been a while since you just stopped and been alone with Jesus. Third one is that King Jesus is more concerned about my soul and my sin than my aches and my pains. Sometimes that's a hard one to accept. But it's a greater priority to him that my soul is right with him than my body, my physical body is right with him. I had cancer. Actually, we all have cancer. I could do a whole seminar on this. But we all have cancer. It's just some people it hasn't activated. Well, mine got activated at one point. And, oh, man, that was a low time in my life. And I had to have a radical surgery done that, I mean, I couldn't even drive for a long time. I'd lay in the back seat while Stephanie drove me everywhere. I'd preach Sunday morning so I just hold myself up while I kept preaching. And I have, and my life physically was altered. I have, a, I have a colostomy bag, this thing that hangs on me. My constant companion pulls on me all the time. I know it's there. There's a number of times I don't know it's there. 
And I can tell you there are some days when Stephanie would just like to get in the car by herself and drive somewhere else and not be around me. (laughs) There are some days it just gets to me and I get so mad and I get upset. Why do I have to have this? And usually if, if you see me like that, you know, you'll come up to me and you'll try to console me. You'll say, Adam, oh, well, it's better than the alternative, Adam. Yeah, yeah, I know that. I've heard that one before. But you know what gets me out of it? What, what gets me out of it is I got to come back to that place that, wait a minute. What is more necessary in this situation? What's more necessary is that God cares about my soul and that I have this living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus will come up alongside of me and say, Adam, we'll take care of that bag later. There'll be a time when we'll take care of that. And I have to stop and go, yeah, that's right, Lord. It doesn't, it doesn't matter physically what I'm going through. What matters is my heart is right with you and my soul is right with you. That's what matters. And Adam, we'll take care of that bag some other day. Man, am I looking forward to that day. Oh, if you see somebody in heaven dancing around like crazy, okay, that's me. That is me. But we need to remember what's urgent may not be always what's essential. And in Jesus' eyes, what's essential is people hearing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when evil presents itself, it's addressed and taken care of and taken before the Father and cast out. That's what's important. So I want us to close with...